Photography 101, hosted by Scott Wittenberg. Lesson 19. Hello again. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you. That's nearly 8,000 people worldwide who have made this podcast number one in the visual arts category on iTunes for over two months now. To be able to share something I love so much with so many is both a privilege and an honor. Thanks again for this unique opportunity. In this lesson, we're going to learn some tips on how to explore the world up close by means of macro photography. So what is needed to be able to do this? Well, it takes a special kind of lens with the ability to focus on objects very close to the lens, called a macro lens. It has never failed to surprise me how many of my students aren't even sure if their cameras have macro lenses or not. But if they find out that they indeed do, they can't seem to get enough of exploring this exciting medium. If you're not sure if your camera has macro capabilities, try this little experiment. Place something small, like a coin, on a tabletop. While looking through the viewfinder, come in as close as you can to the coin, making sure that it remains in sharp focus. If you're able to get within a foot or less of the coin and still keep it in focus, then you have a macro lens. If you have to back up several feet in order to get it in focus at your lens's greatest length, then you don't have macro capabilities. But don't be discouraged. Those of you who don't have macro lenses can purchase what is called a close-up filter that screws onto the end of your lens and will allow you to take close-up shots. Although this isn't quite as good as having the real thing, it's the next best thing and an inexpensive alternative. What makes macro photography so special is that it allows us to see things bigger than life. Our eyes only allow us to see so much of an object close up and in clear focus. A macro lens brings objects into focus that we can't possibly see with the unaided eye. This opens up a whole new world that lets us see things in ways we have never been able to see before. In this picture, we see something that at first isn't recognizable. It looks like a flower of some kind, but has a hard, shiny, glass-like texture. This is actually a macro shot I took of one of Chihuly's glass sculptures. Note that it's very difficult to gauge the actual size of the subject because there's nothing else in the image to suggest any kind of scale. It is a world unto itself, you might say. And what about this shot? A simple garden windmill becomes an interesting abstract shape when photographed close up. Macro photography allows us to come in very close and crop out unwanted portions of objects, leaving us with intriguing shapes and colors that can sometimes boggle the imagination. There are a couple of things to remember when shooting macro shots. One consideration is to remember that you will need more light to make an exposure when shooting up close. This is because the distance the light travels from subject to film, or the photo sensors in your digital camera, through the lens becomes greater the closer you get to the subject. Secondly, depth of field is much more shallow when shooting macro, making shapes in front of and behind the focal point to go out of focus. This can be corrected to some degree by increasing your f-stop number, remembering that the higher the number, the smaller the hole, and therefore the greater depth of field. But with a smaller aperture opening, a slower shutter speed will be required to compensate. And if your shutter speed falls below 1 60th of a second, you'll need a tripod to keep it all in focus and eliminate camera movement. In fact, it's a good idea to use a tripod for all macro photography to avoid out of focus shots. Another way to get more light on this subject is to use flash, either on camera flash or studio flash. Flash provides plenty of light for exposure and therefore allows greater depth of field. The trade-off for this, though, is the unnatural quality that sometimes results when using open flash. This can be minimized by using either the flash as a fill light instead of your primary source or using a diffuser of some kind over the flash head to soften its harsh quality. Shallow depth of field inherent to macro photography can be a plus since the emphasis remains on the subject as a result of blurring out a distracting background. For example, in the shot of a Gila monster, the cage it's in becomes nothing more than a muted blue landscape, allowing our attention to stay on the lizard. The ability to crop out the background is especially evident here, where the frame is filled with the head of this macaw. The spine of the cage in the foreground is distracting, however, despite the fact that it's blurred out. Remember that depth of field works both ways, both in front of and behind the subject. 
If you have a depth of field previewer, you can see the actual effect of depth of field in a scene at any given aperture prior to snapping the shutter. This capability is a huge asset to macro photography. In addition to shape and color, texture can also be greatly exploited and accentuated by macro photography. Note the sharp spines and delicate flowers in the shot of a small cactus plant. The radial symmetry around the spines would be lost without our ability to get in really close to this wondrous example of nature's handiwork. An ordinary red onion becomes a study of light, color, and texture in this macro shot. I shot both the cactus and this onion in the studio using reflected light off an umbrella from the right side of the subjects. The pure black background was achieved by using felt, which absorbs light and makes the subjects really pop out. Repeated shape and color is evident here in this macro shot of pistachios. Filling the frame with your subject can create a very dramatic effect. The image becomes its own little macrocosm, you might say, leaving the larger, visible world completely out of the picture. Here's something that really gets to me. My students sometimes complain about how there isn't much to photograph in their community, that it just isn't very photogenic. That's when I remind them that there's a whole wonderful, unexplored world out there to be found in macro photography. All it takes to enter this world is a camera with a macro lens and a willingness to keep an eye open for little things to explore. You can always find them anywhere you go. Well, that's about it for now. I hope you've learned something new in this lesson. Until next time, goodbye.